Now today, friends, we come to another one of the remarkable little books of the Bible. Now, for some time, we've spent a great deal of time in these very brief books of the Bible that are ordinarily either ignored or passed over rather quickly because they are brief. And that's been my custom, very frankly, when every time I've gone through the Bible before, I get near the end and we generally run in late and I just start moving fast. Well, we're not doing that this time, as you have noted. We are taking our time, and we're finding each one of them is just like working in a gold mine, because all kinds of rich nuggets are there just for the mining, and we're spending our time here in these small books. Now, as we come to the little book of Jude, it's another one of these very remarkable little books. So I would like to put out an introduction to this little book at first that you and I might be able to understand something of its contents. The writer of this book is Jude. That is the English form of the name Judas. Now, Judas here was the brother of James and he was also a half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have seen that. And there are three Jameses. There are many that find four, and that's all right. I frankly go along with that, but I only use three in my notes and outlines because I think that makes a proper division. And then when we come to Jude, or Judas here, we find there are three Judases that are mentioned in the Scripture. And we find that this man, along with James, that is, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus. Now, I want to turn to a Scripture that will be helpful to us in this connection. It's over in the 13th chapter of Matthew, in verse 55, And it says here, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. So James and Judas, that we have the writer of the epistle of James and the writer of the epistle of Jude or Judas here is a half-brother of the Lord. Now there are two other Judases the one that's infamous and best known, of course, Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve apostles who betrayed the Lord. Now, there was another apostle by the name of Judas, and the way that he's distinguished is in John 14, verse 22, where it says, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot. Well, the way he's distinguished is he's just not Judas is carried, but he's another apostle with the name of Judas. Now, we believe, therefore, that the Judas here is actually the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you will note that he doesn't identify himself in that way. And we also noted James followed the same pattern. By the way, he did not attempt to identify himself as the brother He called himself James, a servant of God. Now, Judas here calls himself Jude, or Judas, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So he identifies himself to us, I think, rather clearly here, who he is. He is the half-brother by Mary, and that Mary was the mother of Judas, mother of Jesus, but not the same father by any means. So that what we have here is a man that calls himself the servant, and the word for servant is bond slave. He calls himself the bond slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Now, why didn't James and Judas seek to capitalize on their relationship 
They're actually blood relationship to Jesus, having the same mother. Well, I think the reason is quite obvious. They took the position because neither one of these men believed in Jesus until after his resurrection. That is the thing that called it to their attention and confirmed them and convicted them that he was who he claimed to be. Up to that time, they thought that he'd just gone off on religion, that he was beside himself, and that he was not who he claimed to be. But after his resurrection, they became believers. So you see, it would be possible to have been brought up in the home with Jesus in the days of his flesh and not have recognized him. In fact, I have used, as many of you know, one of the Psalms to depict that period of the silent years that his own brethren did not recognize him and ridiculed him. He was very much alone, apparently, in the years as he grew up yonder in Nazareth. Now, the reason that I say that is obvious is this, that as Paul put it, we know him no longer after the flesh. Though we have known him, we don't know him any longer after the flesh. And Judas now, though a half-brother recognizes he's the glorified Christ and that that human relationship is not meaningful to him in any way, he had to come to Christ had to come as a sinner, accept him as Savior, just as anyone else did. And this, by the way, is a marvelous answer of both James and Judas to the thing that arose after the apostles. There was a period in there when the family of Jesus was treated in a rather superstitious and a sacred way, as if they were something special. Well, actually, they were not. They were just human beings. I've always felt that Protestantism actually ignored Mary. She was a wonderful person. It was no accident that she was chosen of God to bear the Son of God. But that does not mean that she is to be lifted above women. She takes her place, as she very frankly says, among women. And therefore, she's blessed among women, but never above women. So that that period through which the church went, it was a brief period when all the family was lifted to a very high position. And certainly Judas and James would oppose that because they themselves take the position of being just a bond slave of Jesus Christ. And he identifies himself that way and a brother of James. Now he says to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Now, the word sanctified actually is not in our better manuscripts. And some of our best scholars have called attention to it, the New Schofield Reference Bible. And they have a good note on this. They say literally that it should be translated like this, "...call beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ." In other words, the word sanctified is actually the word beloved are loved of God. Now, this is something that we need to note very carefully because it's very important here. He calls himself a bond slave of Jesus Christ. And again, let me, as we move along, say this again, that he absolutely does not claim a blood relationship as if that would give him a superiority. And that ought to lay to rest the notion that arose in the early church after the apostles. It came along in that post-apostolic period of treating all the family as if they were sort of super-dupers, you know. But Vincent, the outstanding Greek scholar, says that Jude does not allude to his relationship to the Lord 
may be explained by the fact that the natural relationship in his mind would be subordinate to the spiritual, and that such a designation would not be of any value. And Dean Alford puts it like this, "...they have been in harmony with those later and superstitious feelings with which the next and following ages regarded our Lord's earthly relatives." That's important. Now, we move on to them that are sanctified by God. Now, both Nestle and Westcott and Hort, who have, I suppose, the best Greek texts that we have today, they use the verb agapao to love instead of hagiodzo to sanctify. And that, I think scholars agree, is accurate. And it makes it just a little bit more precious to our hearts that are sanctified by God the Father, that are beloved by God the Father. Now, I would like to share with you the translation of Dr. Weiss, the late Greek scholar at the Moody Bible Institute. And he has given us a translation in many places, though it is a little involved. It certainly brings out the original meaning, and he had a knack for that. So I'm going to read that now in the translation he has. Jude, a bond slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who by God the Father have been loved and are in a state of being the permanent objects of his love and who for Jesus Christ have been guarded are in a permanent state of being carefully watched to those who are called the called ones. Now, this is a very important passage of Scripture, by the way. They've been loved. And I would like to dwell on this for just a moment, because they're beloved of God the Father, and they are preserved for Jesus Christ and called. Now, there's several words there that I must deal with in this text because they're very important to see. The first word here is preserved. That word is the word that you're going to find that gives us the key to this little book. Actually, this little book is going to present the apostasy as it's presented nowhere in Scripture, and how frightful that it is. But he doesn't write just to frighten the daylights out of you. He doesn't write just to draw a vivid picture, which he does, of the apostasy. But he gives this dark background in order that he might give assurance in days of apostasy. And in other words, he uses here the word keep five times. That's what the word preserve means. They're kept in Jesus Christ. And it means that God is the one that keeps them. You find it again in verse 6, the angels who are kept. And then you'll find it again when you get down to verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. And then in verse 24, now unto him that's able to keep you from falling. Now, this has to do with the keeping power of God to keep those that are his own. And you can call it anything you want to, but it gives assurance of salvation to the believer even in the dark days of apostasy. And as we are going to see, I believe that we are in the apostasy today, but how much farther we'll go in it before the rapture, I do not know. And I'm sure that no one else knows. But we are definitely in times of apostasy. And this word here, that we are preserved, it can be translated kept. But the interesting thing is about preserved, there are two ways of preserving things in the physical world. One is with vinegar, and one is with sugar. Now, there are a lot of saints today that I think they are preserved, all right, 
but they're preserved in vinegar, and they act that way, and they have a vinegar disposition. And then there are those that are preserved in sugar, and they are sugar and spice, and everything is nice. And they're not just all women either, by the way. They are another group of saints. But I would not want to say that they're not saints of God because they're preserved in vinegar, because I think that they are. And the perseverance of the saints here is by His grace which preserves or keeps them. They overcame Him, how? By the blood of the Lamb. That's the only way that they're going to make it through the great tribulation. Those that are here, they will overcome by the blood of the Lamb. And that's the only way we are going to overcome today. There'll be no merit in us. And I do have to resort back to the illustration that the Lord Jesus himself gave. I am, he says, the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Then he goes on to talk about his sheep. He says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Now, if the sheep are saved, it's no merit to them. If they are kept, the merit goes to the shepherd, because a sheep cannot defend himself. He doesn't have sharp teeth. He has no fangs. can't fight that way. And he doesn't have any claws, and he can't run. If he was like a jackrabbit, can't defend himself either. But a jackrabbit can get away from trouble. But a sheep can't even do that. A sheep is helpless unless it has a good shepherd. And if a sheep can say, I'm safe, and I know that I'm saved, the sheep is not boasting. All the sheep is saying is, I'm boasting I've got a good shepherd. I've got a wonderful shepherd. And my friend, if you are saying that you're not sure, then you really are reflecting on your shepherd because he says that he can keep you. He says, no created thing is going to take them out of my hand and my father's hand. We're going to hold on to you. Now, it's not a question whether I can hold on. It's a question whether he can hold on. And he says he can And it's a matter of trusting him. You see, assurance of salvation rests upon the Word of God and what God has said. And it's a question of whether you believe him, whether you trust him or not. It all rests upon that because he's made it very clear that you have a sure salvation. And here we are presented with the dark days of apostasy. And he still says that he's able to keep them. Now, not only are they preserved in Jesus Christ, we're safe in him. We are today accepted in the Beloved. No one can pluck us out of his hand. He says here, and called. This word call, though it has in it the thought of an invitation that is sent out and accepted, it's more than that. The word call, actually, as it's used in the Scripture, is not only an invitation that is sent out, but it's an invitation that has been accepted and been made real because of the Spirit of God. And let me give you Paul's statement of this. He says in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 22, For the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block. But under the Greeks foolishness. But under them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, if you have found in Christ the wisdom and power of God and you've trusted him, You're the call, my friend, and that's what he's talking about. This is the invitation that has been sent out, and when it's accepted and believed, then you're the call. That's exactly what he means here, and it's what Paul means, because Paul spelled it out for us. Now, we're going to find many wonderful things in this little epistle that we actually have not had before. As we have said The 
theme of this little epistle is assurance in days of apostasy. And we are going to see where this man intended to write on some theme of our salvation. But the Spirit of God put up a red warning sign and told him to call attention to this warning of the days of apostasy that were coming upon the church. Now, Jude, in his epistle here, will give the most vivid account that we have of the apostasy. He presents it in a very dramatic manner, and he gives the only record in the Scripture of the contention of Satan with Michael the archangel over the body of Moses. Very remarkable passage of Scripture, and we're going to talk about that when we get there, that today, in this materialistic age into which we have come, God had been pretty well ruled out. In fact, they had conducted his funeral up in New England at one of the universities there, but apparently, as Mark Twain said, when a report got out that he had died, he says it was exaggerated. And so the report of the death of God was exaggerated. And the very interesting thing is that today there is an overweening interest in the supernatural. And in the supernatural, in the sense that there are evil forces at work in the world, demonic power, and that there is a power for good, and that this is spiritual. Now, today that's not being made clear by any means. The exorcist that has been so popular, it has, of course, drawn multitudes and curiosity because this generation... I know nothing in the world but materialism. But all of a sudden, there is a breakthrough into the unseen world. And there is a force of evil. And there is a force of good. And it's got a great many people troubled. Well, back of that force of evil is Satan. And we're going to be talking about him in this little book here. And then only Jude gives the prophecy of Enoch of the Lord coming with 10,000 of his saints. And that word 10,000 is a figure of speech that's used for a whole lot of saints, friends. Now, we have in the first three verses the occasion of the epistle. And in the first two verses, we have the assurance for believers. And then the theme of the epistle is changed to the apostasy in verse 3. And then from verses 4 through 16, we have occurrences of apostasy. And then verses 17 through 25, we have the occupation of believers in days of apostasy. In other words, what can believers do? And so we have here these three divisions, the occasion, the epistle, the occurrences of apostasy, and then the occupation of believers in days of apostasy. Now, let me read verse 1. Jude, or Judas, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Now, I'm going to, again, give Dr. Weiss's translation because I consider it very enlightening, although it is somewhat involved but it brings out the meaning of the writer. And I think what the Spirit of God would have us to have. It says, Jude, a bond slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who by God the Father have been loved and are in a state of being the permanent objects of his love. He not only loved us, he's just going to keep on loving us, you see. Now I read again and who for Jesus Christ have been guarded and are in a permanent state of being carefully watched to those who are called ones. Now, actually, today, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, they've got their eye on you. (laughs) And if you're his child today, they're watching you. They're taking care of you. And you say, well, my, why do all these things happen to me? Well, I ask that question sometimes myself. I don't have the answer for it. 
But I do know this. He permits it, and he does it for a purpose, though he doesn't explain it to us now, but he will by and by. That's going to be one of the wonders of heaven, I think, is that you and I are going to get some answers that we don't get down here, in spite of what people say. There are a lot of questions that are not answered. God really told us very little, by the way. I feel like that even the Word He's given us is sort of an ABC book, and that someday... He's going to get us out of the kindergarten and get us off of pablum and really start enabling us in eternity to become that which he intended man to be. That's going to be a great day, friends. Notice now verse 2. He says here, "...mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied." We have here, Mercy instead of grace. Grace is generally the word that you find in all of the epistles. But here it's mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Now, the other day, I talked about this matter of love and mercy and grace. And peace now has been added, and we'll say a word about it here also. We need to recognize the difference of these three words, love and mercy and grace, and then to see that there is a very strong relationship of them. They are related together. Now, love of God is an attribute of God. And because God is love, why, he is merciful and he has provided grace. Now, the love of God is that he loves all of mankind. God so loved the world. It's not his will that any should perish. And uh, he today loves every human being, and he has no favorites at all. He made it very clear to Moses that he didn't even answer his prayer because he was Moses. But God says, I'll show mercy to whom I will. Show mercy. God says, I do it because I find the explanation in myself. I treat all my creatures alike in that sense. So that God loves you today. And he loves you so much if you and I today knew how much he loved us. Actually, it would break our hearts. We'd be in tears. Now, you can keep from experiencing that love. You can put up an umbrella of resistance to him. You can step out of his will. You can have sin in your life. There are many things that will cause you not to experience the love of God. But that doesn't mean he's not loving you. You can't keep the sun from shining, but you can put up the umbrella and keep the sun off of you. So there's certain umbrellas you put up to keep the love of God off of you. Now, though God loved you, he never saved you by love. Because God has other attributes. He's holy. And he is righteous, and he's just. And he just simply can't let down the bars of heaven and bring you in by letting down his standard. He can't do that any more than a crooked judge. Well, I ought not to put it quite like that. Any more than a judge, if he's going to uphold the law, he can't reach under the table and accept a payment under the table to let a criminal off. If he does, may I say to you, he's a crooked judge. Now, if God is going to do that with human beings, he's no better than the crooked judge, and I do not mean to be irreverent. God has to maintain his holiness and his righteousness and his justice. So God so loved the world, and he loved the world with a merciful love, a love that had a concern and care for them. And because of that, he gave his only begotten son. And now God, on the basis of this sinner not presenting anything to him, but God now on a righteous basis can save him if he'll come to him and accept his salvation. And that's called the grace of God. By grace are ye saved. Now, today, I think it's going to be worthwhile for me to do this. Dr. Trench, who was a great Greek scholar, he made a distinction of these words. And I want you to listen to this 
It's a rather extended quotation, but I'd like for you to hear it. The word for mercy is elios, the word that's used here, and grace is charis. Now, I'm quoting from Dr. Trench. While charis, that is grace, has thus reference to the sins of man and is that glorious attribute of God which these sins call out and display his free gift and their forgiveness, Elios, that is mercy, has special and immediate regard to the misery which is the consequence of these sins. Now, you see, the grace of God has to do with the sins of man. That is, God has provided a Savior who's paid the penalty for sins. Now, on that basis, God saves, and that's the grace of God. But you see, sin has brought tragedy to us. I heard this on the TV, on an interview of those that wrote the exorcist and the man who did and those who were in the play. And apparently, they really got involved in that. They certainly believe in the supernatural, but their point was, why does a God of love permit cancer, you see? May I say to you, cancer is the consequence of sin. God did not give you cancer. That's the result of sin. Disease has come to man because of sin. Now, the mercy of God... He sees the misery that sin is calling. The mercy of God goes out to man because of the consequence of sin. And God is rich in mercy. So if you come to him as a sinner, accept his salvation, he'll save you by grace, and then he's rich in mercy, and he'll extend his mercy to you. He'll bring you comfort in that time. He'll comfort your heart. He will help you, and you can trust him at a time like that. Now, let me keep reading here, because this is tremendous that Dr. Trench is saying to us here. Again, let me say, the free gift in their forgiveness, that has to do with the grace of God. But his immediate regard to us in our misery, that is the mercy of God, you see. And it's being the tender sense of this mercy displaying itself in the effort which only the continued perverseness of man can hinder or defeat to assuage and entirely remove it in the divine mind and in the order of our salvation as conceived therein, the mercy precedes the grace. God so loved the world with a pitying love that he gave his only begotten Son that the world through him might be saved. But you see, in the order of the manifestation of God's purposes of salvation, the grace must go before the mercy. That is, the chorus or the grace must go before and take away and make way for the elios, the mercy of God, you see. God has to save us by his grace first. Now, I hope I've made that distinction clear or maybe I just muddled it up good for you. But now the peace of God is that experience which comes to the heart that has trusted Christ. Paul says, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's to know that God is not difficult to get along with. He's not making it hard for me. He's not making it hard for you. He today wants you to know that he hasn't anything against you now. You've trusted Christ. No, you're a sinner. The world may point its finger at you, reject you, but he's accepted you, and he loves you. But may I say, he wants to give you that peace so that at night you can pillow your head, and you can pillow your head on what Dr. Tari used to call Romans 8.28. He says that's a soft pillow to put your head on. All things work together for good to them that love God, those that are called according to his purpose. How wonderful that is. Now, we come down to verse 3. You see, I'm moving very slowly and intentionally so. This little epistle, oh, it is loaded 
loaded with dynamite, we're going to find out later on. In fact, it's a regular little atom bomb. Now, verse 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Now, the New Testament is written in what is known as the Koine Greek. That's the word here, Koine. It actually means that which is common to all. The Koine Greek was the Greek that was understood actually all over the Roman Empire in Paul's day and in the days of the apostles, by the way. Now, will you notice here, he says, I was going to write on some doctrine, apparently, of our salvation. I don't know what it was. It could have been redemption. It could have been the person of Christ. It could have been Christology or soteriology. It could have been on prophecy. It could have been on sanctification. But he didn't write on those because... He says, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, the thought here is that the Holy Spirit detoured Jude from writing on some theme of the faith in order that he might sound a warning of the impending apostasy. And apostasy now is a departure from the faith, that is, the apostles' doctrine. And actually, what was just a little cloud the size of a man's hand in Jude's day is now a storm of hurricane force that fills the land. And so he's going to talk about the apostasy that is coming on the earth And we can see that many of the things that he's going to tell us here are already taking place in the world today because the apostasy is the one thing that has come to pass. And it's already here. The apostasy is not something we're looking for. Apostasy is here. And it is a departure from the faith. He now is setting the course that he's going to steer through this little epistle. This is a very wonderful little epistle as he begins at this point to outline for us actually what we have labeled here occurrences of apostasy. There have been apostasy of the angels, a departure of them. There's been a departure of men back in the Old Testament from the faith. Then in the church, there was those that would depart from the faith. Now, he says here, it was needful. I need to. In fact, there was a compulsion and a necessity and a constraint upon him. He says, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. That is, some great doctrine that the apostles gave us. It was needful for me to write under you. And he says, now I was constrained. It was absolutely necessary. A necessity was laid upon me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And this word to earnestly contend, those that have suggested that it meant to contend on your knees. Well, I have never been able to find any authority for that at all. And I don't know where they get that idea. But I do know this, that the thought here in contention is not to be a fiery fighting fundamentalist. I wish that we fundamentalists could be fundamental without being always fighting and always being fiery. It seems to me that we need to recognize that there is some Scripture that says we contend without being contentious. Or, as Paul put it in 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 26, he says, "...the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach," that is, ready to teach, patient 
in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So that this is the thought that is in mind, that there's a compulsion. And then to contend for the faith also has in it the idea of agony. In fact, the word is epagonizomai, epagonizomai. And you see that word agony in there. And we get that English word from the noun of this word here. And apparently Jude was going to write on some doctrine. Now he's saying that we are to contend or to defend the great doctrines of Christianity. These were the doctrines that are called, you remember in Acts, it says the early church continued in the apostles' doctrine. That was number one, and that's number one on God's church parade, by the way. Now, church is not a church unless it's doing just that. And we're told in Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love, or someone has translated it, truthing in love. That is, if you're going to give out the truth, give it out in love, and if you don't give it out in love... There's some question about whether you're giving out the truth. And to be able to give an answer to those that ask you. A man ought not to just be a man quick with a short fuse and become angry today about someone who differs with him. I think that we're prepared now to hear the translation that Dr. Weiss, formerly of the Moody Bible Institute, he's the late Dr. Weiss, by the way, And he has, I feel, like one of the finest little books that gives the literal of the book of Jude. And I'm using it here a great deal, as you can see. Now, I'm going to give you his translation. And the reason I don't give you mine, because his is the best. Will you listen? Divinely loved ones, when giving all diligence to be writing to you concerning the salvation possessed in common by all of us, I had constraint laid upon me to write to you, beseeching you to contend with intensity and determination for the faith once for all entrusted into the safe keeping of the saints. That's a marvelous translation. Now, he is going to set before us here the reason we should contend for the faith. Why should we? Why not just give the word out? And my thought is that that's one way you contend for the faith is to give the Word of God out. But something has happened to the church, and that is the alarm that he sounds. Verse 4. Now, I'll read our translation that we have in our Scripture, authorized version. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is a very important verse that we are coming to here. We are told that these men were before ordained to this condemnation. And I think that we probably better clear that out first of all, because actually the word is they were written of beforehand. The word is prographo, and it means to write beforehand, which simply means this, that other writers had sounded this warning. In other words, what he's saying here is simply that There have slipped in, men have crept in unawares, and they are men that have done two things. They are by nature ungodly men, and they do two things. They turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and then they deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, they do two things. 
they really distort and deny the grace of God. And they deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the way they are identified. He'll give further identification later on. But right here now, these men, they have crept in. In other words, they're a bunch of creeps because they crept in unawares. And this is one of the most interesting words in the Greek here. The word is par es duno. And duno means to enter. And the little preposition eis, or ace, means into. And the word para means beside. And actually, it means to enter alongside. Or as Dr. Vinson puts it in his commentary, to get in by the side or to slip in a side door. Now, this is the way the apostates have come into the church. Now, I've been in the church for many years. I have been and am still an ordained Presbyterian preacher, but I'm in no denomination today, none whatsoever. I have no denominational connection at all. But that was the way I began. And I remember when I began that the church that I was raised in in the South was a church that was, by and large, sound in the faith. And when I went to college, I began to discover that there were ministers that denied practically everything. It opened up a new world to me. And then when I got to seminary, I found out that it was still growing. And the day came when I left that denomination and came to California, entered another one, and when I saw it going by the board, I resigned. I got out. I wasn't put out. I just stepped out voluntarily. Now, may I say to you, during that long period, I saw how these men came into the church. They came in by the side door. They came in by professing one thing, but actually they pretended to be what they were not. And may I say that that is the interesting word that is used here. They come in by the side door. They don't come in the front door declaring the position that they take. And unfortunately, many of our good laymen have been taken in by ministers like that. And the Scriptures warned about them. For instance, Paul, over in 2 Corinthians 11th chapter, verse 13, listen to him. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Now, that word that's used in 2 Corinthians is a very interesting word. It's metaschematizo, and it's translated transformed. In other words, it's the act of an individual in changing his outward expression by assuming an expression put on from the outside. That is what the word really means. Satan uses that method. Now, how does this work? Well, I'll tell you how it works. I have seen as many as a dozen strong, outstanding churches across this land fall into the hands of liberalism by this method. It's the most deceitful method in the world. May I give you an instance of one church, and I'll not attempt to locate it, because the chances are you'll know one in the area in which you live. And the way that the liberals took over was, it at one time was a church that preached the Word of God. People were saved. Hearts were blessed. And the pastor they had retired or resigned, and a new man appeared on the scene. And he met with the pulpit committee, met with the elders, or whoever he meets with at first, and they ask him about his belief in the great doctrines. And he assured them 
that he believed in all the great doctrines of the faith. He's now coming in the side door because he really doesn't believe them, you see. But he pretends that he believes them. On the outside, he pretends to be sound in the faith. And the interesting thing is, his trial sermon is a pretty good sermon. He probably read Spurgeon or Warfield or G. Camel Morgan, and he came up with a good sermon. And they all said, my, this young man, he is just fine. But remember, he's coming in the side door. <laughs> he doesn't believe it at all. And they call him, and he comes to the church. And before long, they discover that they have a liberal on their hands. And fundamentalism has never stooped to use deceitful methods. That is, generally, those in the church, they don't want to oust this young man in a bad method. However, I think if he came in the side door, they should boot him out the back door. But they don't do that, and they tolerate him. I know right now two or three churches being ruined by a man that they thought they were getting one thing and they got something else altogether. And this is the way that this is presented. Now, they were written of beforehand. That is, Jude is not saying, I'm telling you something new that you didn't know, because others have written of this and others have warned you of that which is coming. Now, I want to take a look, if you don't mind, at several passages where others spoke of this. Now, first of all, the Apostle Paul. You will recall when he went by Ephesus, he gave them a warning in his last visit. In Acts 20, verse 29, listen to him. He says, "...for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, also of your own selves, shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every man night and day with tears. Now Paul said, I tried to warn you of this. But the day came when the church in Ephesus yielded to this type of thing. Now again, Paul warned a young preacher. Over in Second Timothy, the third chapter, verse 6, listen to him. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. And unfortunately, and I want to say this rather carefully, unfortunately, there is a grave danger today this all-woman movement in the church. It's almost like a women's lib movement that has a spiritual overtone. I think it's tragic when the wife is attending a Bible class and knows more than the husband. That marriage may be headed for the rocks, by the way. The husband should be taken along. And after all, Paul said that there is a danger of these creeping in. The class may start off in a marvelous way. But if it's a success, you're going to find that somebody's going to try the side door and slip in. Now, I want to be very clear on this. I'm not backing down on anything that we said, but I do want to be understood clearly. I think one of the greatest movements there have been in our day, and there have been several, actually outside of the church, has been this Tremendous movement of the study of the Word by women and women's Bible classes all across this country, and thank God for them. But in the history of the church, to begin with, there has never been a woman theologian. That is very strange indeed. Never has there been a woman theologian. And in most of the cults. The leaders and the founders of some of them have been women. And also, it is true that they have played a prominent part in many of the heresies that have come into the church. Now, I want to make this statement very clear, if I can. My impression is, and I don't claim to be an authority in this particular field at all, that a woman is built 
finer than a man. She has finer sensibilities than a man. She has a closer perception, I think, than a man has. I know that I can go to a meeting and I can meet folk and we come away, my wife and I, and she said, did you know this? And I didn't know it at all. Did you know so-and-so? And, well, you know, I never got on to that. I was rather stupid, I guess. But she got a world of information that I didn't get because she has a perception that I do not have. Now, because of that, any fine instrument is in danger of being led astray also. I have to be more particular with my watch than I am with the motor in my car because this watch is a much finer instrument than the motor in the car. And I treat the car pretty rough. And I think for that reason there is a grave danger. And I've heard this voice now by several ministers across the country. There's a danger of these becoming women movements totally outside of the church and not cooperating with the church at all and operating entirely without the local church. Now, I think it's been, first of all, the failure of the local church. The failure of the church today has led to many of these movements that have taken place outside. The youth movement, for instance. And we have found out in radio, we have moved largely outside of the local church. Now, we try to work with the local church. And we believe that all of these movements should work with the local church if it's a Bible church. Any Bible-believing church, we ought to work with them. And there is the grave danger today. And that's the warning that Paul is putting up. There's danger of these false teachers coming in the side door. And I personally think that any movement that the Spirit of God seems to be blessing needs to be watched very carefully because of the fact that the devil's going to come in the side door. And if you think he's coming in as the devil, you're wrong. His ministers are ministers of light. And we need to be very careful. And I think and I give this warning continually on the radio, we need to be careful of the radio teacher. I tell folk constantly, many of you have heard me say this, you need to investigate the radio program you support. You ought to know about it. You ought to know something about it before you support it. And we believe that that is something that's very important. Now, Simon Peter said in the second chapter of Second Peter, verse 1, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. The thing that is the final test, the acid test, is his teaching regarding the person of Jesus Christ. If he denies the deity of Christ, you can rule him out immediately, and you have to be very careful about this matter of the deity of Christ because there are so many facets in which they can deny the deity and give the impression that they actually believe in him as the Savior of the world. So that we need to be very careful today. Now, Paul, again in Galatians 2, 4 says, "...and that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Now, friends, we need to guard every movement where God is blessing today. These organizations that are outside of the church, they may go off on a tangent because actually the ministers of Satan are waiting to come in the side door. They won't come in the front door. I think it's foolish to guard the front door. They're not watching it. They're attempting to come in the side door. And these men are men that are characterized by one thing. They're ungodly men. Actually, in their lives, they just leave God out. I heard this concerning a man that is a Bible teacher. And I was amazed at this couple, because they do have spiritual discernment. They said, you know, we attended his classes, and we are greatly impressed by him. He's a good Bible teacher. We consider him outstanding. 
But we were disturbed by the fact that he was carrying on an affair with another woman who was not his wife. And this was all out in the open where many of us could observe it. And this man was willing to tolerate that. Well, may I say to you that that is the thing that we need to recognize, that these men may teach the Bible and may give an appearance, but what about their lives? That is very important. And are they putting God in their lives? Ungodly means they just leave God out. They are not taking him in consideration at all. And then that is their character. But they do two things here. They turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Now, that word lasciviousness is a very important word. We're paying particular attention, if you've noticed here, to words, because They are actually very important in the study that we are having. And the word here, I suppose the best word for it is wantonness. And the word wantonness has in it the thought of lawlessness. And it's an arrogance of doing as you please, even if you offend the sensibilities of others. That is the whole thought that is in this word here. So that they turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness. That is, they turn the grace of God into actually immorality. And this is the thing that Paul warned about in Galatians, the danger of turning the grace of God into a license that would permit you to do and live any way that you please. He warned against that, that that was always a danger. And I'd like to turn back to that. He says in Galatians 5, 13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And so you find that gross immorality is the thing that characterizes these because They have thrown overboard all of the great precepts of Scripture concerning morality. They call it today the new morality. Now, that's been adopted by many church leaders. And there is a growing danger in this country of the church actually espousing and condoning gross immorality. And the danger has been expressed by one writer... He says one of the troubles with the world is that people mistake sex for love, money for brains, and transistor radios for civilization. And it was Dr. Wallace Petty. He said that the creed of the present day is God is a creation of wishful thinking. Religion is a mechanism of escape from reality. Man is a glorified gorilla who asks too many questions and represses too many desires. Morals are a matter of taste, love is an art, and life is a racket. That is the viewpoint of some today, by the way. And this wantonness is marked by an arrogant recklessness of justice of the feelings of others. And I'm giving you now Webster's meaning of the word, willfully malicious. And that is today the flouting of this matter that marriage is not essential, that you live with whoever you want to live with, a total disregard of the morality that builds homes and thereby builds a nation. And it was about 1959 that Vice Admiral Robert Goldwaith was chief of naval air training. He told a group of leading educators, businessmen, law enforcement officials, and others, that there is a surge of immorality in civilian and military life. He said, moral decay is an acute national problem. Now, remember, that was back in 1959. Think what it is today. This is something that ought to alarm Christians today. And they ought to be very careful about the man that is teaching in the church. Is he teaching a loose morality? That is something that's very important. 
And then the other thing that would characterize him, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He would deny the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he gives us, therefore, then, these three marks of an apostate in his character. These apostates are ungodly men, and they are not converted. They leave God out. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. That is, that's blatant immorality, shameless sin. They arrogantly and proudly flout sin publicly. And in Jude's day, it was Gnosticism. Gnosticism taught that the body was essentially evil and that all matter was evil and the spirit alone was good. And as a result, it did not matter what a man did with his body. He was free to satisfy the lust of the body. Now, that was a perversion of grace. But that thing has sprung up again today. That's actually the new morality. That is a broad... It's old Gnosticism. It's old as the first heresy. And then denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And that, of course, is the mark of an antichrist. John, in his epistle, as we saw, called them antichrist. And it's the spirit of antichrist that denies the Lord Jesus Christ. May I say to you, these are very important things for us to have before us, and that's the reason I've dwelt so long at this place. Now, he's going to give to us here six examples of apostasy in the past. Now, I want to talk just a little about this word apostasy. We have had that up when we were in Second Thessalonians. And the word aphistomi, phaia, gives the meaning of it, to remove, to withdraw, to go away, to depart. And in Second Thessalonians, I take the position there that it has a twofold meaning because the word literally means to depart, to remove. And it means the removal of the church because in the first epistle he had talked about the rapture of the church. Now he says that rapture must come first, the ephistomy, the departure, the removal of the church. Now the removal of believers down here will lead to the total apostasy, that is the departure from the faith. And the Lord Jesus asks the question, and he asks the question like this. He says, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find the faith on the earth? And the answer is no. That's the way he asks the question. In the Greek, the answer is no. He will not find the faith at all. In other words, there will be the total departure, the total apostasy. Now, that cannot come about until the true believers, the true church, is removed from the earth. And that, of course, could occur at any moment. Now, friends, we come back to this little epistle of Jude, and I think probably since we've been in it now for several days, we need to back up and just take a brief review that will be helpful for us. Now, we have found out that Jude was the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the flesh, but he never mentions it for several reasons. The early church, after the apostles gave a particular prominence to the family of Jesus. And Jude certainly would not agree with that because he calls himself only a servant of Jesus Christ. And after all, we know him no longer after the flesh, but the resurrected, glorified Christ. Now, Jude picked up the pen of inspiration to write. This man, during the lifetime of our Lord, never believed in him. It was not until after his death and resurrection. So he's now writing of the resurrected Lord, and he had to come as any other sinner to Christ for salvation. And so this man picked up the pen of inspiration to write on some theme or truth concerning our gospel, our salvation. He could have picked justification by faith. But Paul had written on that in Romans, and he could have picked the resurrection 
of Christ. But Paul had written on that in 1 Corinthians. Or he could have picked the doctrine of reconciliation. But Paul had written on that in 2 Corinthians. Or probably could have written on the great subject of faith. But Paul had written on that in Galatians and also Hebrew. Or he could have picked the body of Christ, the church as the body of Christ. But Paul had written on that in Ephesians. Or he could have picked the person of Christ, but Paul had written on that in Colossians. Or he could have written on our great high priest, but the writer to Hebrews had already written on that. Or he could have picked fellowship, but John was going to write on that later on. So the Spirit of God caused him to develop another subject and not develop one of the great doctrines. The Spirit of God arrested his purpose before he could even put down his subject and directed him into another channel. And the subject was the coming apostasy. And what Jude did was to hang out a red lantern on the most dangerous curve along the highway the church is traveling. And the Bible bus is coming along that same highway. And that's the reason we're paying attention to this red lantern that Jude has put out for us. And it describes in vivid terms, with awe-inspiring language, the frightful condition that was coming in the future. Or this little epistle's like a burglar alarm that apostates have broken into the church. They came in the side door. Nobody was watching that side door, so they came in. And this little epistle is like the first atom bomb that was exploded. The first one didn't fall in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but it fell, by the way, when Jude wrote this little epistle. It's an atom bomb, and it exploded in the early church as a warning. Now... He is going to give us here, as we've said, six examples of apostasy in the past. That is, a departure from the faith. And there will be three groups and then three individuals given. He'll give the three groups first and then the three individuals. Now, first, he'll give here the three groups. Verse 5, "...I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this." that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Now, Israel in the wilderness, in unbelief, was destroyed, and it is an example that God does judge apostates. And here you have Israel at Kadesh Barnea. Now, I'm not going back to lift that story out. But you will recall in the book of Numbers, Israel came to Kadesh Barnea, and they refused to enter the promised land. Now, God had given them an abundance of evidence. In other words, he permitted them to send in spies to spy out the land. They brought back evidence that confirmed the fact that the land was the kind of land God said it was was a good land. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. It's not the land you see there today. The judgment of God is still on that land and will be on it until they are back there worshiping God, and their return will not only be to the land, but will be a return to God. Now, the spies brought back that evidence that God was accurate. But they didn't believe now that God could bring them in the land. First, they didn't believe it was that kind of land. They said, let's stay out here. This is a good place. And that was the wilderness. Now, they will not believe God. Now, that was an example of apostasy, a departure from the faith, you see. They departed from the basis on which they left Egypt. God says, I will take you out of Egypt and I will bring you into the land. Now, that generation, God pushed them back into the wilderness, left them there for 38 more years till that generation died. Then God says, your children that you thought would be a prey, I'm going to bring them into the land. You see, the excuse they used was their children. Well, you know, I have the children, and that is the thing that keeps me from serving the Lord. And they were saying the same thing. 
we must think of our children. Well, it sounds very good, but it infers that God wasn't thinking of them. God says, I'll take care of you. You'll go in and take the land. But they would not because of unbelief. Now God pushes them back into the desert. They'll be there now for 38 more years till that generation passes away. Everyone but Joshua and Caleb of that generation that came out of Egypt. They are the only two that entered the land. It was the new generation that crossed the Jordan River and took the city of Jericho. Now, they did not enter in because of unbelief. 